This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. In this video, I'm not going to be doing any conservation work. Rather, I'm going to be creating something. And I'm going to be building a brand new hot table, which, without a doubt, is the most important piece of kit in my studio. After moving to my new location, my original hot table, which was built nearly 40 years ago by my father, failed. And while I was able to repair it and reverse engineer it, I found that I didn't want to be without a hot table ever again. Because while conservation can be practiced without a hot table, it's much like being a chef without an oven or a range. The results are less perfect and everything is much more difficult. So the first step was to build the base, and I chose to use extruded aluminum tubing for the base because it's lightweight, it's super strong, and it's flexible in that you can build just about anything with it. And the first step is to tap all of the legs so that they can accept threaded leveling feet. And this is important because my floor isn't perfectly level and I need to make sure that the table doesn't distort as I'm working on it. This is a lot of work for the 12 legs and using a hand tap, but ultimately it's gonna be well worth it because I will have a surface that is perfectly flat and level, making sure that all of the results are that much more precise. After the legs are built, I can begin preparing the gussets, which will hold all of the aluminum extrusions together. I figured I needed about 80 to 100 of these, and with two bolts and two nuts each, it was a lot of tedious work, but there's no way around it, and these are going to provide excellent support to make sure that the table is strong and rigid. So with all the parts ready, I can start the assembly process of the base. And this part of the build isn't particularly complicated or really all that interesting, but here I need to pay very close attention to what I'm doing so that I make sure that the base is assembled with precision and accuracy. Because if I make a mistake here, I'm not gonna discover it until I get the aluminum surface put onto the table. And at that point, it's gonna be almost impossible to disassemble the table and correct it. One of the reasons I was attracted to aluminum extrusions as opposed to steel angle iron or wood is that it's very easy to assemble without any specialized tools. I can feed the gussets into the track, I can assemble it, tighten it with an Allen key, and go back later on using a drill with higher torque to make sure that everything is locked in. Altogether, the assembly of this base probably took about two hours, mostly because I was going really slowly and double checking all my work because again, I don't want to have to go back and undo anything later on. Ultimately though, I was really happy with how this went together and just how strong and durable this aluminum base is. It doesn't look it because the aluminum is pretty thin, but as you can see, I can climb on it, walk on it, and there's almost no deflection. Now, I'm not terribly heavy, but if it can hold me, it can surely hold what I'm gonna put on top. So with the base all built, I can turn my attention and focus to the gauge display for the electronics. And I'm gonna start with paper and pencil because it's a lot easier to lay it out here and then move to the material I'm gonna use for the surface. And all of the temperature controllers, gauges, and switches have very specific distance requirements per the manufacturer for heat dissipation. So I have to make sure that I'm meeting all of those. Once I've met all of those and I like the arrangement, I can cut out the template and transfer it to a piece of hardboard or MDF or uh, masonite because that's what I'm gonna be using for the surface. I'll transfer all of the markings and then I'll cut them out using a jigsaw and drill off screen. Now I built the control panel's box out of three quarter inch plywood. I primed it and painted it and mounted it into the aluminum track. And I chose plywood because it's easy to work with and it allows me infinite possibilities with respect to mounting the equipment. Now finally, before I get on to mounting any of the electronics, I need to make sure that I actually like how the gauge operates and looks. I also need to make sure that everything fits. So I'll do a dry run, make sure that everything fits and operates how I like, and then I'll move on to the complicated electronics inside the box. 
Now, because all this stuff is going to be hidden, I'm not terribly concerned about how it looks, but I want to make sure that there is enough space between all of the components so that any heat that is generated can dissipate. Because I'm working with 240 volts, there's a lot of electricity that's going to be flowing through these components, and I want to make sure that none of them fails because they overheat, because that would render this table worthless. Now I have to make my own electrical cord because, again, I'm using 240 volts and you can't just go out and buy one at the store uh, that's going to meet my specifications. So not a big deal, but just again, everything has to be custom. Now at this point, I'm going to pause and I'm going to decide if I actually like where the table is situated in the studio. Because right now, without all of the other equipment on top of the table, it's pretty easy to move. It's just a lightweight aluminum frame. But later on, it's going to be just about impossible. I'm also going to take this opportunity to level the table using those feet that I installed in the first step. And this is kind of tedious, there's no fast way to do it, but you know, I don't really mind because I'm enjoying this build. I mean, frankly, building stuff is just a lot of fun. Not everything. Uh, yeah, everything. What are you talking about? Not websites. When I built my first website, I had to learn HTML, JavaScript, CSS. I had to make it mobile friendly and I had to learn search engine optimization. And when any of those standards changed, I had to tear the site down and rebuild it all over again. It was a real pain in the- Whoa, whoa. Well, luckily now there's Squarespace, where with a few clicks, you can create a beautiful, modern, sleek website that works anywhere. And Squarespace is taking care of the HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You know, all that stuff under the hood that makes a website cool. So you can focus on the design. And you know what? If you get stumped or run into an issue, you don't have to go searching YouTube for an answer. They have 24-7 human support to lend a hand. And the best part? With Squarespace, there are no splinters or bruised knuckles. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Baumgartner to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. I wonder, you think Squarespace would let me use my own coupon code? Now, back to the build. And the next step is undoubtedly my least favorite part, but definitely the most important, and it's the wiring of the electronics. I'm using both 120 and 240 volts here, so I need to make sure that everything is just right, otherwise I will get electrocuted, or I will start a fire, or I will open the gates of hell, or rip the space-time continuum. Now this wasn't easy for me, but reverse engineering my old hot table gave me a lot of insight into how to build a new one, and I have more information about the details, the actual wiring schematic, and the parts I used down below in the description if you are at all curious. Suffice it to say, it took a lot of time, but everything worked out. Now this is the vacuum pump that's going to provide the suction pressure for the table. And I could have kept the plug-in inline switch and turned it on and off manually, but of course I'm building this from scratch and I want to make sure that it's completely custom and operates the way I want. So I'm going to integrate this control switch into the panel, and that involves rewiring the vacuum pump. Not terribly difficult, and only took a little time, but well worth it. Now with all the electronics complete, the table really starts to take shape. I'm laying down a layer of quarter inch Luan plywood on top of the base as a support for the one inch polyisocyanurate insulation. And this is necessary because I wanna make sure that all of the heat that I generate, all of the heat that I pay for is going up and not down to the floor. And I'm using six silicone heating blankets here. And I've decided to use six as opposed to one big one or two smaller ones because if one fails, the whole table won't be rendered useless. And it also gives me the ability to have multiple zones. I've chosen to wire these up in groups of two, so I have three zones. And that means that I can have three different treatments going on at the same time. Without a doubt, the most expensive part of this table was the aluminum surface, and I chose to use half-inch 6061 aluminum, and I got two pieces because I wanted to make sure that if I ever needed to disassemble this table, it could be done so and transported easily, because at 10 feet by 7 feet, one full slab not only would have been cost prohibitive, but impossible to move. Now I mentioned that the electronics were almost completely wired up, but there's one important step that I have to do before everything is ready to go, and that's to wire up the thermocouples. Thermocouples are devices that sense heat and send back a signal to the temperature controllers, 
and without these, the temperature controllers just don't have any idea how hot the surface is, and they don't know whether to add more electricity to the heating blankets or to pull back on the electricity to the heating blankets. And so these thermocouples get bonded with a fixed tropic epoxy designed to bond aluminum under high heat to small aluminum squares that will then get bonded to the large aluminum surface. And having three thermocouples and three different zones with three sets of heating blankets is really great because it allows me to have multiple zones of heat. Now, one of the drawbacks is that aluminum transfers heat really well. And so if two of the zones are on and one is off, there's quite a bit of heat loss transferred to that cold zone. But it's a compromise that I'm willing to make because it allows for more flexibility for me in the way that I use the hot table. And it builds in a little bit of safety in case, as I mentioned, one of the heating pads or one set of electronics fails. Now the final step in the hot table build is to get those two big aluminum slabs onto the surface of the table. Now I've enlisted the help of my younger brother who has so graciously given up one of his days off to come over to my studio, lift very heavy, very sharp pieces of aluminum, climb underneath the table, work in a cramped space, and generally get bossed around and yelled at by me. He is my younger brother, so he knows the drill. Thanks, buddy. Right here you can see that we're feeding the thermocouple wire through the insulation and the plywood, and now that's gonna get fed back to the control panel, and that's gonna provide the reading for the temperature controllers. Now you can see that we're spending a lot of time orienting the table and making sure that it's just so, because it's really heavy, it's unpleasant to lift and tinker with, and once it's in place, we can't really slide it around because it will distort the heating blankets underneath. So we want to make sure that we get it right on the first try. Now, once we get that one in place, we can set up for the next one. And we're using those scraps of Luan plywood and 2x4s on top of the heating blankets so that we don't press the aluminum directly onto the blankets. If, for some reason, we were to damage one of those blankets, it would be a huge expense and it would require me to disassemble the table and rebuild it, and I'd be pretty upset about that particularly because it would have been a mistake that was totally and completely avoidable. So again, we're feeding the aluminum thermocouple wire down through the table and just nudging the table around so that we have it in the exact location that we want it. And again, the benefit of having two smaller slabs is that two of us are able to handle this. If I had one slab, it would have been over 500 pounds, and I only have one brother, so I'm not sure how I would have navigated that massive piece of aluminum around the studio. In addition, if I ever have to disassemble this table to do some repairs, let's say one of the heating blankets fails, or I want to move it, uh, having two pieces of aluminum is going to be a lot easier than one. Now that said, I'm going to bond these two pieces of aluminum together using that same epoxy that I used to bond the thermocouple to the underside of the aluminum slabs. And the reason that I'm going to bond them together is because even though this aluminum is heavy, even, and straight, as it heats up there may be some micro movements, and I want to make sure that those distortions don't affect how the table is used. That is, I want to try to make this as uniform of a surface as possible because that's essential for use and operation of the hot table. So I'm going to add some of that epoxy to the edge of one of the slabs and then I'm going to lower the other slab down and we're going to push it into place. And the good thing about using this epoxy is that it can fill a gap of about a half a millimeter, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's plenty of space. The other good thing about this epoxy is that it's thermally conductive. So it doesn't add as a thermal break, but a thermal bridge, meaning that it will transfer heat from one piece of aluminum to the other. And that's really important because I want to make sure I have even heating across the whole surface. Now I'm going to clamp everything in place and I'm going to add a little bit more epoxy to this joint to fill that gap in just because I want to make sure that there's a really smooth surface. I'm not so concerned if there's a buildup of epoxy 
uh, and some of it will squeeze out as it dries, that will all get sanded down and scraped down later once the build is all complete. It's better to have too much and remove some than not have enough. So at this point, we've just about cleaned up. Everything is just about done, and me and my brother are going back and forth and trying to decide how awesome of a job we did and uh, if we deserve a beer. My brother is also trying to convince me that he deserves a very big paycheck for this labor, and I'm trying to convince him that he loves me enough that he did it out of the kindness of his heart. That uh, debate is still open. We are working on it, and I'll get back to you guys when we do resolve it. So the last thing to do is to put the control panel on, screw it in place, and put the cover panel on. And nothing exciting here, just a lot of countersunk screws. I may have gone a little overboard on the screws, but um, this thing is not going anywhere. So you can get a quick glimpse of the electronics and the um, pneumatics that are wired up. Uh, again, I'll have a complete schematic down below in the description if anybody's curious. And if anybody has any real questions, you can contact me directly and I can uh, explain it in more detail. So at this point, with the last screw going in, all the work is complete. So with all the work complete, the table is ready for its maiden voyage. And I can turn one zone on and leave the other two off. I'll use the temperature controller to set the desired temperature and allow the table to heat up. This table takes about 10 to 15 minutes to reach 150 degrees. My old table took about 30 minutes to reach that same temperature. And I'll calibrate this system with an infrared heat gun so that the temperature controller is reading the same as the heat gun and any discrepancies are corrected. Now this table has two vacuum ports for two different hoses. And these hoses allow me to exert pressure with the vacuum pump down on the painting. I can adjust that pressure with the dial and as you can see, I can go from almost nothing to really quite a lot. So at 10 feet by 7 feet, this table is really big. And it's going to allow me to treat paintings of a scale that I haven't been able to treat before. It's going to expand what I can offer my clients and what kind of projects I take on. It was a lot of work, and at times I was unsure, but everything came out in the end, and I'm really happy with this piece of kit. So, thanks for watching as always. If you have any questions, go ahead and ask them below and I'll do my best to answer.